Okay, so yeah, thank you for inviting me here today. Um, this is our recycling facility in Brooklyn. You can see our nice wind turbine there in the background. Um, so my background's mostly in recycling, but I'm really excited about what we're doing in terms of solar and wind. So I wanna share with you today what, we're, what we have going on there. So just for some background, um, uh, Sims Metal Management is the larger company that we're a part of. I work for Sims Municipal Recycling. Um, so Sims Metal Management, they're in all the light blue countries. Um, they mostly deal with uh, scrap metal, industrial metal. Um, mostly they have really large shredders that can handle processing these big cars and I-beams. I um, and there's Sims Recycling Solutions. They deal with electronics, uh, like e-scrap. And they do that careful dismantling of electronics before selling the individual components. And then there's our division, Sims Municipal Recycling. We do um, curbside material, so um, bottles, cans, cartons, paper. That's the kind of stuff that we accept in and then separate it out into different categories. <coughs> so our biggest contract right now is um, we have a contract with Department of Sanitation for New York City. Um, the contract's for 20 years, a very long time long-term contract for recycling um, deal. We process the metal, glass, and plastic. New York City, we still have our dual stream program with metal, glass, and plastic in one bin, paper in the other. We get the metal, glass, and plastic stream. We also get about half of the city's paper, um, but our machinery is set up for the metal, glass, plastic. The paper we really just receive on site and then redistribute to other paper recyclers around the city. So um, this is where we're located. Um, in Brooklyn is where we have our, big, our biggest location. That's our newest facility in Brooklyn. We also have transfer stations in Hunts Point in the Bronx and Long Island City. So let's say you live up in the Bronx, the white department sanitation trucks, they'll pick up from your house, drop off at our transfer station. We load it up onto a barge and it comes down the East River to Sunset Park to our processing facility there. So um, most of our material is getting to Sunset Park on barge. Um, which was really important for the community when we came in there. Um, they didn't want all the trucks from all over New York City coming through their, their neighborhood. Um, we still also do some processing in Jersey City and Claremont, um, but yeah, most of our operation is in, in Brooklyn now. So, so yeah, this is a, our newest facility. It's 11 acre pier. We get stuff there on barge, rail, train. Um, and yeah, we, we could be handling it all, all of New York City's material in that one location. Uh, we get about a thousand tons a day of material um, from that blue bin. Um, yeah, and this is where we have both of our solar and wind, so I'll talk about that in a second. I uh, just wanna make a quick pitch for our recycling education center. So that's what I run out of, out of our Brooklyn location. We really want people thinking of not just where you should put things, that's really important, like which bin it should go in, but then we want people thinking of like the next step and what happens to your material after you make that decision of where it should go. Um, there's a whole industry behind it and sometimes people aren't really aware of the steps that it needs to take before it can be used again. Okay, so this is what it looks when we first get it, this big pile of recyclables. Um, this is what we get and this is what we have to separate into different uh, categories so that it can be sold to, to make the new products. When you come and you see the big operation, it can be kind of overwhelming of um, the steps it has to go through in order to make it um, to the factories. Um, so I have an, a little video I want to show you to give you a sense of the type of factory we run and um, to see what's going on there. Believe it or not, people have been required to recycle in New York since 1989. It's one of those laws that is not heavily enforced. More than half of all the recyclables that are produced in New York City are still thrown out in the trash. Even at the relatively modest recycling rates the city achieves today, there's still an enormous amount of material. And so that both justifies and actually requires us to put in a lot more sorting equipment than, uh, than one would typically find. We're doing about uh, five, 600 tons a day here. We have another facility in Jersey where we run another 300 tons a day or so. We're getting about 900 tons a day of this material. Our process consists of taking that mixture of material we get from the curb, and we run that through the processing system, which consists of a very large, slow-speed shredder, which opens up all the bags and disentangles everything, 
disc screens, which are used to screen away all the glass. The magnets are pulling off all the ferrous metal, which we then further separate into a tin can fraction and anything that's ferrous metal but not a tin can. Ballistic separators are separating two-dimensional from three-dimensional material, and then a whole sequence of optical sorters to eject various grades of plastics as well as cartons. Basically that camera, through the near infrared light, is taking a photograph of every single object on the conveyor belt. This one is looking for PET plastic. It tells which air jet to fire. will actually fire on that PET bottle and eject it onto two conveyors. I think actually we have about two miles, more than two miles of conveyors in that plant. We do as, as good a job as we can with the mechanical systems. We have this last manual quality control system. These guys are either looking at something that's trash that shouldn't be in there, or something that's a different commodity like aluminum that shouldn't be in there either, but we want to recover. We actually spend a huge amount of time and money just getting the plastic bags away from the other recyclables, and then it ends up it's a residue going to a landfill. The materials might be in our system from two to ten minutes from the time it's pushed into the infeed conveyor to the time it's pushed out of the back end as either a baled product or a bulk material to be sold. Fascinating is that this is just one step in the process. You then follow that bottle on to the next accepted where it's being ground, washed, flaked, pelletized. Um, there's a lot that goes into it. And we're a private company, for-profit company, and we're, we're in the commodity business, but, but the recycling industry, as far as I'm concerned anyway, is inherently part of the sustainability economy. It's not specific to New York, there's a larger wave that, that isn't going away in terms of awareness about environmental issues. I do think New York is going to get its act together in the recycling world. Okay, so that's what we have going on in Brooklyn. Um, <laughs> Okay, um, and these are just some of the examples of things that we make. Um, so we bale up those commodities. Um, each bale is about a thousand pounds, and they get shipped to the factories where they'll start to be used. So recycling has its environmental benefits, using less natural resources, less energy to make those products. Um, but we're doing a few things on our site itself that we think are good choices for the environment as well. Um, one thing is our bioswales. So all of our non-industrial stormwater from rooftops and parking lots, that's going through bioswales on our site. Um, so we have like big pits that the water will stream into. It's absorbed by the plants and it doesn't have to get sent to a sewage treatment plant. We're, this facility is right on the mouth of the Gowanus Canal, um, extremely polluted waterway. So anything to reduce the amount of pollution that has to be handled by those sewage treatment plants is really important. Um, then we have artificial reefs. So on the far side of the pier, that's where the barges come in and it needs, needed to be really deep. So they uh, dredged out some of the material there, removing some of the shallow habitat. Um, they replaced that material just in, just in front of the pier, right over there. Um, and that serves as like a breakwater, a nice area for uh, fish to have nurseries. At low tide, you'll see birds eating the fish in the area. Um, just anything to help improve the the water, water in that area, the environment, um, because it's it's under so much strain with the Gowanus so near nearby. Okay, then uh, so we're using rail on this site as well. Um, rail is an extremely efficient way to transport material. There's not many companies using rail anymore for commodities in the city, but um, when they built this new facility, they did include that. So it goes down First Avenue in Brooklyn to Bay Ridge, where it connects to a float bridge or a flat barge that takes the, the rails across to New Jersey. Um, right now it's just steel that we send out on rail, but hopefully in the future will be more, more material. Uh, then we have our fuzzy ropes. So off the, the further closer side of, of the pier, that little tiny pier, we have ropes hanging down. It's just basically a serrated polypropylene rope 
that um, has an increased surface area and it encourages mussels to come and grow on the ropes. Um, mussels are great at filtering water. Um, this tiny project isn't going to clean up the Hudson, but if every business along the along the Hudson did something like that, it, it could make a difference. And then all our planting, all the plantings that we put in were native species. We didn't remove some of the big trees that we had there that were invasive, but um, anything we put in was was native, less watering and such. Okay, so something else we did for the sustainability of our site or resiliency of our site. Um, was that we raised the pier about four feet above the original grade. Um, that was well above what the FEMA floodplains were at the time, um, but we were convinced that uh, climate change was happening and sea levels were rising, um, and they wanted to prepare for that. Our contract is 20 years, but there's two possible 10-year extensions on that, so we could be at the site for 40 years, um, so we need to make sure that all our equipment wasn't get flooded every 10 years or so. Um, so that paid off extremely quickly. Um, during construction still, we just finished the buildings, we just moved our equipment in, um, and then Sandy happened. So we were all at home terrified that we were never gonna open, it was all over. Um, but thankfully we had raised it enough and there was no flooding inside the buildings. Um, so yeah, it was about a $1 million investment, but yeah, saved many millions. So that was a good idea. Not lucky. <laughs> okay. Um, so then our solar panel installations. So when we finished uh, the new facility, we included it with solar panels installations. It's a 600 kilowatt system, 50,000 square feet. When we finished it, it was the largest one in the city at the time. Now there's, I think, a few bigger ones like up in the Bronx, um, and that's terrific. Um, th this provides about 15% of our energy, our facilities needs. So you saw that enormous processing equipment. It, it is very energy intensive. intensive. So 15% um, is, is quite a lot of energy that it's providing. Then we um, more recently finished our, our wind, erected our wind turbine. So that's a 100 kilowatt system. Um, it goes up to 160 feet at the tip of the blade, 30 feet blades. Um, and this is the first commercially sized wind turbine in New York City. Um, this is the first like horizontal one. You might see the vertical ones, um, but yeah, so, and this makes about three to 5% of our energy needs. Uh, we just installed it in December, so we'll see how, how things play out and where we are within that range. So um, some of the challenges that we had to overcome for insulation. So of course, the biggest for solar and wind was the financial, financial justification of it. Um, we're pri we work for the city, but we are a private company, um, and we need to make sure that we are going to get a reasonable rate of return on these large, because for us it was a capital project. Um, we need to make sure we pay off in a certain amount of time. Um, thankfully, there were great grants out at the time, um, federal and state, state, sorry, tax incentives. So federal and state tax incentives that were really important in our decision to go ahead with it. Um, both our solar and wind should pay off in about five years, um, and given our plan to be on the site for at least 20 years, that was a pretty easy decision to make. After five years, we'll be absolutely saving directly money on that, so that's excellent. Um, so something that a lot of places have to consider when you're putting in solar is, are the buildings capable of handling it? We always knew that we were going to be putting solar on the building, um, so that was a pretty easy thing for us. We, we did uh, stabilize with additional steel um, to make the buildings more prepared for it. Whereas some, a lot of older buildings in New York City can't just throw on solar panels, they're not set up to handle it. And then, um, so I'll show you another picture, but the roof that the solar panels are on right now, it's, it's on an angled uh, roof. It's about a four degree slope on, on the roof, um, which you know isn't ideal. Ideal is more like 30 degrees for getting um, the most solar that you can out of, most energy out of it. Um, but that four degree did make it enough that we didn't have to tilt those tilt the panels additionally, um, so there's no shading on the roof. They're all flush with the four degree roof. Um, then with our wind, so wind, of course, this was, a, this was more controversial. There's no other big wind turbines, so um, one thing that when we first had the idea was to get the community buy-in. Um, we went up to, does anyone know Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn? It's a great one. Um, so they have an excellent view of, of downtown Manhattan, of the water. Um, so we wanted to make sure that they were okay, that this was gonna be part of their view now. Um, and 
there was no hesitation there. They were very happy to have that. We're in a very heavily industrial area, so having a wind turbine is kind of like a neat thing rather than just a gray building. Um, and then, of course, the concern with, uh, with you know, wildlife. So we went to the Audubon Society to get their feedback. Um, and of course, wind turbines are known for causing problems with birds and bats. Um, but the Audubon Society is definitely still in support of, of renewable energy. And they were always on our side of putting it up and giving it a try. We did, they did make the recommendation of using black blades on our wind turbine. Um, with the white blades, if, a, if light shining on it can be practically invisible for the birds and the bats, but the black blades are, are easier to see. So it's been working out very well so far. Um, then, so placement of the turbine is an important um, issue. We have an 11 acre pier, so there was a few options of where we wanted to put it. So um, we did have a long, long term testing of which area got the most wind, and we found a great spot for it that's quite windy. Um, and then there was the issue of, of just getting the permits to put this in. It was about a four year process of going back and forth with the city and figuring out who should be dealing with this. Um, and yeah, the technical review board, they mostly dealt with small wind turbines um, and they weren't really set up to handle our, our type of request. So it, it did take a lot of time and a lot of convincing that what we were doing was being done the right way. Um, but someone has to do it, so it worked out. Um, then, so now that we have them operating, there's still, there's a few issues um, that we're trying to work out. So together they make about 20% of our energy needs. We can easily consume that on a daily basis. On Sundays, we're not operating on Sundays. So if it's a, a very sunny and windy day, that might be a time that we're feeding back into the, the campus grid. Um, and and at this point, we're still not getting credit for that. Um, so it's just going into the system. So, and that's particularly challenging for us because we're on city property. So we need to first deal with the Economic Development Corporation and then deal with Con Edison. So it's just uh, a little extra red tape that makes things challenging. We're, co we're confident it'll work out, but right now that's a challenge for us. Um, then the load power factor. So let's say you're a business who's just uh, consuming energy from the grid, not producing anything. Um, if you decide to uh, take on a new project and you're using a lot of energy on one day, um, that extra energy usage will be charged at a higher higher rate. And for us, when we, if we, uh, let's say it's, it's very cloudy and it's not windy, and maybe we, we're producing less than we normally are, um, we're gonna be t drawing more from the Con Edison grid, um, and that's gonna cause, cause us to be charged at a higher rate which is kind of, that doesn't really make sense for us. Um, so that's something that we're trying to see if there's anything we can do to overcome. I mean, of course, we're still, if we're not being penalized, we're still um, making, you know, we're still saving money by having it to begin with, but um, just that, that slight, uh, you know, trade-off needs to be um, thought of in a different way. And then, so I say cleaning bird residue, I mean cleaning bird poop, um, so we have a recycling operation, it's a little bit fragrant. People aren't as good as they, as we might like them to in terms of washing out their recyclables. Um, so we do have a lot of seagulls coming by and checking out what we're going on. It hasn't really been too much of an issue so far. We've just had to stick with our annual um, cleaning program, but as years go by, maybe we will have to do a little bit extra cleaning than like another type of operation would. But really it just seems like maybe one extra per year. Okay, so um, it's really been a, a great experience. Like we do have we have some challenges in terms of length of time getting the permits, but um, we're quite optimistic that this is something that could be viable for a lot of other businesses. Um, especially with the wind, we were the first one, so maybe the next guy coming in to do it, it'll be easier. The permitting process will be much easier. Um, also, getting Con Edison to think about people are now producing large amounts of energy. How are you going to deal with that in terms of the rate structure? And um, yeah, like, I mean, people see us doing it, they can then be more confident in their decision that um, this isn't such a risk, like the wind turbine's not gonna fall down on your first day, um, that this can be done. And then of course, uh, we do hope that people who have uh, solar panel installations, wind, that they think about expanding. For us, we're very open to that. We don't have specific plans yet, but um, 
there's some things in the works, so hopefully we'll get some other stuff going on soon. Okay, so that's pretty much all I had today, but look forward to your questions later. Um, and not sure if I introduced myself, but that's pronounced Aideen. Don't look at all the vowels. Mm -hmm.